My life is filled with certainties and I have a margin of error. Now, of course, there are health issues and a few other types of uncertainties all of us face. But this is qualitatively different from what somebody living in poverty faces. If you throw away the certainty and you throw away the margin of error, then you have poverty. Am I going to have the income for my next meal? Where is the water going to come from? Where is the cooking fuel going to come from? And so on. Let's get into what it means to live in subsistence marketplaces. What does it mean to have low income and associated characteristics such as low literacy? And I'm thinking back to 1997, when I took a group of people from central Illinois shopping, I gave them a hypothetical task. I gave them about $50 and asked them to buy six different things. And what I can tell you is, I left and went home thinking the things I take for granted. The story I'm gonna tell you is one where the things I take for granted are not just material, they are in my ability to think, feel confident, and cope. So here we are at the store in 1997, and I was amazed at the things that people have to overcome. First of all, you can't read signs. And if you can't read signs, you have to keep on asking people. And that can be humiliating. So you run, you search, you search, you come to the shelf, you find your product, you've already exhausted a lot of time and effort, you pick it up. There's no time to look through all the brands and weigh the alternatives and so on. So that's what it means to have low income and low literacy as well. If I have to buy 150 candles, I have to find a box of 100 candles and a box of 50 candles. And then I can say, well, I've got what I need. Well, that takes effort. If one costs $1.50, how much does three cost? Well, it's easy for me, but for somebody with low literacy and low income, they may need a calculator to compute this. People often avoid percentage of signs because they cannot compute the final price. 70% off, 30% off, People may stay away from it. Half off, sometimes people feel a bit more confident and go and buy such products. People may often look at the package size and just buy the product because what you see is what you get and it is very difficult to be getting into unit of measurement and so on. It's very difficult to comprehend. Unit pricing is a very difficult thing for people to follow. It's an abstraction. It's based on price, it's based on size and so on. I have not seen people use unit price. Nutritional labels, fiber content, sugar, etc. What do these things mean? They seem so abstract as well. So that's the point I wanted to make. The things I take for granted are not just material. So let me try to describe to you some of the things that we have learned. And I'm gonna start with thinking. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is what I ended up calling concrete thinking or concrete reasoning. And the way I describe it is through an interview I was doing with a person and I kept asking, what kind of bread would you buy? And he said, I buy the cheapest. So I then said, well, what if you have, uh, you know, twice the number of uh, you know, slices and you get it for one and a half times the price, you're getting more bread for the money, why not buy that? And he said, no, I buy the cheapest. Now, sometimes you buy the cheapest because you don't have enough money. But this was more than that. This was due to difficulty abstracting between price and size. And that's something I take for granted. And that's what I mean by concrete thinking, combining pieces of information to reach a higher judgment. If you move to a tribal community in Tanzania, where you have to walk four hours to get to the Saturday marketplace, people often told me they buy the biggest. Well, you buy the biggest soap. Why? Because if you don't and you run out of it, you have to wait for the next Saturday and walk four hours and do without it. Well, why don't you buy three smaller pieces? They're about the same volume and then you get a better price. No, I buy the biggest too complex to be making all those abstractions as well. So that's what I mean by concrete thinking. There was a Russian psychologist who in the 1920s studied peasants in Central Asia, and he would show them an ax, a hammer, and a saw, 
and he'd say, what's the word for it? Now you know right away that the word for it is tools. It's an abstraction. And these are instances or examples of tools. Well, what these peasants would say is, you know, if I have trees, I can use the ax, I can chop up the branches, I can burn the wood and keep my family warm. So generally this means concrete thinking as in living in the immediate visual graphic world of here and now and how can I use something. That's what we mean by concrete thinking. Healthiness is an abstraction. Well, you know, if you have blood pressure and you have, uh, you know, a certain weight and so on, you can get this condition. Those are all very complex kinds of things. So when you ask people, are you healthy? They'll say, no. Or if you ask people if they're healthy, they'll say, yeah, I'm not in the hospital. So they'll take an extreme instance and use that to represent the word. Whereas my notion of healthiness is a lot richer. Just to give you an example of the words we take for granted and how we take those very words we use for granted and our literacy for granted, let me give you a scenario. We used to provide women with marketplace literacy education. And at the end of the education, after three days, I would go in and ask them what they learned. And they would tell me, I'm gonna check expiry date now. I'm gonna take over buying from my husband. I'm going to you know, make sure and tell the shopkeeper, if you don't give me a good deal, I'll go to another shop and so on. And I stopped them and I said, why didn't you do this three days ago? And you know, you can have fun with it when you build a relationship. And I'd say, well, whose money were you using three days ago? It was still your money. And one woman gave me a great answer. She said, I never thought of myself as a customer. I just thought of myself as somebody who buys and here's somebody who sells. And that's what we mean when we say we even take the words we use for granted. We take the word customer or consumer for granted. That means so many things to us. That means apps, that means online, that means in-person, that means my rights and so on. All of that is not developed for somebody with low income and low literacy as well. They have not had the exposure as well. They don't have the money to have the exposure. So that's what we mean by concrete thinking. One other thing that happens is even causality can be very flat. So here I am, I had a symptom, it's gone, so I'm fine. Rather than, well, what happened? Why did this happen? And so on. So just imagine the pandemic. And here we have this unseen danger. We have so many complex issues changing at the ground level. And what happened is that we have to think about the precautions. We have to think about the next danger and so on. Imagine how that would have been for somebody with low income and low literacy. These are the very same people who are the most unequal among us, but they are the most essential. They are the ones who took care of me and my ability to survive the pandemic. Imagine the world for them because of their difficulty abstracting and understanding what's happening. So that's what we mean by concrete thinking. We take the very words we use for granted. Let me give you one more type of thinking that we have uncovered as well. That is called pictographic thinking. And the idea with pictographic thinking is that I may not be able to read, but I still have my visual sense. Pictographic thinking is more than just depending on pictures. We all do that. We all find pictures more convenient. But pictographic thinking is deeper. It is different. Just to give you an example, I never forget the people I have met. And I'm thinking of somebody I interviewed in 1999. And this person said he could count, but he couldn't read. But he told me I buy the same brand each week, so I had to ask him, how do you know it's the same brand? And he said, there's nothing wrong with my eyes. He said, it's just an image or an object, right? So what he means is, I can see, and I can figure out what that same brand is. That brand name is not a word for him, it's a bunch of wiggly signs, it's an image, it's an object to be memorized. And that's what I mean by pictographic thinking. Some people cannot read numerals, that suggests a very low level of literacy, and so they will pattern match the bus numbers, let us say. So here's a public bus, the number is 17, along comes 17A, which looks like number 17, they'll get on the wrong bus and go. That's an example of pictographic thinking. 
There are people who will get a prescription from the doctor, buy the medicine, pattern match the first letters, and think that they've got the right medicine and take it. Another way in which pictographic thinking manifests is in how much to buy. As I mentioned, unit of measurement is very difficult to use if you have low literacy. So what do people do? They visualize, I'm going to bake a cake, or I'm going to cook this thing which needs salt. Well, if I'm baking a cake, I need sugar. And so they will imagine themselves making the cake and pouring sugar in. And they'll imagine how much sugar they poured and buy the package that matches that. So what does that mean? Well, if the package is half empty and it looks large, they're going to buy much less than they need and pay more for it as well. They're going to buy packages that look like they have the amount they need, but they're going to have a lot less. So that's what we mean by pictographic thinking. Again, more than 25 years ago, I had the privilege of tutoring a 93-year-old woman. And she came up with an ingenious form of pictographic thinking because she could not count. So what she would do is she would think of 10 $5 bills because she had $50 with her. And every time she bought something, she would take a $5 bill off her mind. She assumed, well, it's going to roughly be that much. There's taxes, etc. So she used pictographic thinking as a way to bypass addition and subtraction. And that's what we mean by pictographic thinking. There are people who can drive all the way from Los Angeles to San Francisco without reading a single sign. Just because you're low literate does not mean you don't have your visual sensory ability. So these are different ways in which people think. Next, I want to talk to you about how people feel. I'm going to give you a typical example. I go into the store. I'm just going to make it a cash purchase today. I buy a few things. I go to the counter. I don't have enough money. And I basically put something aside, and I just walk out. No big deal. I forgot. Now, imagine somebody with low literacy and low income who goes to the counter. If they have enough money, it's cause for celebration. They knew how to count. And if they don't have enough money, it's cause for despair because now they have been exposed for their low literacy and that's the cause of their low income, very likely. And that's what it means. What they attribute to that situation is very different from what I attribute. For a mundane shopping interaction, self-esteem and self-confidence may be involved for people with low literacy and low income. So that's what I mean by feeling and how different it can be. There are people who will pay a premium and go to a store where somebody knows them, somebody knows they cannot read and will help them out. They're willing to pay more for that service. And that's what I mean by feeling. And finally, my ability to cope, my ability to behave in different ways in different marketplace situations comes from my um, ability to buy, my literacy, my exposure, my ability to read and learn. Imagine what it is for somebody with low income and low literacy. Well, what it means is that they're going to come up with some very basic rules. For example, I'm not going to go through drive throughs I'm only going to buy one item at a time from the menu because I know I have enough money. I'm only going to make small purchases because if I get cheated, or if I'm overspending, it's a way to correct for it. So people come up with a lot of different coping techniques in order to negotiate the marketplace. So what I've described to you relates to thinking, feeling, and coping. To understand subsistence customers and entrepreneurs and design solutions for them, you need to understand that they are fundamentally different in the way they think, feel, and cope. And these are the things we take for granted. We take all of this for granted because we have the education, because we have the income, and therefore we have the exposure and we have the experience.